Good morning, church. Uh, We invite you all to stand with us as we do the hearing of the word. We have been in the Lord's Prayer, and so uh, we're starting in Matthew 6, verse 7. We're going to extend it a little bit more than last week. And the text says, when you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as Gentiles do, for, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then in this way, our Father in heaven, may your name be revered as holy. May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The word of God. You may be seated. You may be seated. Good morning, Los Angeles University Church. It is good to be here to worship with you, to uh, dive into the word with you. And uh, we have been going through the Lord's Prayer as a church. And we are now at our third week of our series. And as you can see... Once again, I am not alone up here. And I just have to say, just real quick, um, I am extremely thankful for our church. Extremely thankful for our church for uh, letting me be myself. Um, I thank you for our pastoral team to let me um, do things that I feel like are important because I think our church is so much stronger and is so much more relevant when we make space for our young people. And I believe that our church is thriving when our young people feel comfortable here at our church. And so I'm so thankful that we have a church that allows and makes space for our young people to share. And so, Gracie, please introduce yourself to the people who know you and don't know you. Hi, my name is Gracie Williams, and I'm a junior at Arlington High School. I've been a part of this church family for my whole life, and you might have even seen me sing up here on this stage every so often. Um, I am so thankful to be able to share with you all today. In all my 16 years of growing up here at La Sierra, I've watched as pastors come and go, the older youth and big kids graduate, the number of church services went from three to two, and the biggest event of our decade, COVID-19. Now I watch as the younger generation behind me thrives amidst all of this change. One thing that has always been consistent within all of this is the Lord's Prayer. I remember sitting up in that balcony and reciting it with my family. When isolation came about because of the pandemic, I had forgotten all about it. Once we were able to come back to church, reciting the Lord's Prayer for the first time as a community had unlocked memories that I had forgot I had experienced, like being able to say the Lord's Prayer once again with my church family. The Lord's Prayer is, not, is, is an example how to pray. It's not just a prayer that is a wish list. It's a prayer for communal action. It's not a prayer just for me, it's a prayer for us. And this Saturday morning, we are focusing on the part that says, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus shows us how to request God's kingdom, and now we are to request God's will to be done. But what does God's will look like? The biggest thing that comes to mind when thinking about God's will for me is the circumstances that I grew up in. My parents have been and are still the most influential people in my life, constantly pushing me to my limits academically. I've been told that school is my job and that I have to work hard in so that I can have the most opportunities in my future. I remember this story that my parents used to tell and it gives me happiness and slight embarrassment when I hear them relay it. When I was five years old, I got the flu. I ended up popping a blood vessel in my eye, so my parents did what any other Seventh-day Adventist parent would do. They took me to Loma Linda University emergency room to get me checked out. <laughs> Once I was finally taken back, a female doctor had treated me, and I had expressed that I wanted to be a doctor just like her. But she asked me why, and I simply stated that I wanted to help people. Ever since then, my mom has always told me, God willing, you become a doctor. I never understood why she told me this. Of course it was God's will for me to become a doctor. I've wanted this for forever, since I was five years old. But is what I want the most really God's will for me? What does he have in store for my future? This has obviously caused me to think. I do believe that God is personal personal enough to have individual wills for us all. But this is a communal call. So that what we need to ask is, what is God's will for us? When I look at this prayer, I see that it is divided up into three parts. One, affirming God. Two, asking God to give us strength to serve him and others. And three, affirming God again. So to understand the request for God's will that Jesus is referring to, we must understand the context of the first readers who would be reflecting on this formula of prayer. 
The people who would have received the original writings, the people who Matthew was writing to were people who were been oppressed by the Romans. They were people who did not often have the privilege to reflect on what their own will might be. At the time, they are experiencing and doing life under the will of Romans. And so it makes sense that to connect with them, Jesus shows them a better will to live under, the will from heaven, the will of God. And the difference between Rome's will and God's will is that Rome's will controlled them and God's will includes them. And God's will does that today. God's will includes us, all of us. It doesn't matter what we look like. It doesn't matter where we're from. It doesn't matter our gender, who we love, um, how old we are, what, what we appear as. God's will includes everybody. It isn't something just to receive. It is something to be a part of. It isn't something to dismiss our autonomy. It is something to get us active and intentional. And I think a lot of us have heard many voices about what God's will is. And this morning, we want to initially address what we have come to understand what, God will, what God's will isn't. All right, so I want you to journey with us and, and keep an open mind with us as we look at the things, like what are the things that we've been told that God's will is that we have to reflect and be like, is this really what God wants from us? The first thing we want to look at is God's will is not an excuse for bad things that happen. We need to stop trying to see things or trying not to see things as they are. I remember, um, I think it must have been when I was in 11th grade or 12th grade, I had my heart broken pretty badly. Okay? And uh, when you're in heartbreak mode, you do a lot of funny things. And you just need to kind of clarify or just go through your head and like express how you're feeling. And so I remember it was like maybe midnight. I couldn't sleep because of the pain in my emotions. And so... I got up and I saw my mom's car keys. I'm like, let me just go for a drive by myself. Was driving through the Canadian winter in, in Ottawa and I'm driving through, driving around, playing music that made me even sadder. <laughs> but I'm driving around, I'm like, you know, like thinking about my future, thinking about the loneliness I'm about to embark on for the rest of my life. And I'm driving and I get back to my house. I'm like, I'm done. I've kind of cleared my mind. And as I pulled into the driveway, still in my thoughts, my foot's pressing on the brakes. And because of the snow and everything, my shoe was wet. So my foot slipped right back on the gas. And I floored the car. I remember hearing it go and then went right into my garage. Now, I remember getting out of the car and looking up to the sky and saying, God, if you hear me, rewind time right now. Like, I need you to just go back and just give me another chance. I need you to do something. And dropping on my knees and I just remember that moment did not go backwards, it just kept going forward. And my mom came out, was so shocked, angry, livid. And it was so funny because after she had calmed down the next day, <laughs> the, the thing my mom said to me was, that was God's will. Because you stole the keys, God's will was for you to crash the car. I'm like, I don't really get that because we're all in trouble here. Like everyone's suffering. But that was her response to what had happened. And that was like something like, right? That was just me crashing the car. Everyone was safe. Had to fix the garage. Had to lose all my income for the next few months. But that was okay, right? That's something light. But it gets real rough when we start saying that for much more horrible things, right? It gets real painful when somebody loses somebody. Somebody is sick. Somebody is struggling. And we say that is God's will. And we need to stop trying to absolve ourselves from the role humanity plays in some of the things around us. Or even the reality that there are things that happen around us that are just completely out of our control. But it does not mean that God wants those things to happen. And it's important that we take a second to understand that the opportunity for choice is not the same from person to person. And our privileges create a disparity between each one of us. And also, we have to be honest about the choices that some of us make in the privilege that we have. It is tempting to use this text as an excuse for horrible things. But we need to let this text be a motivation for us to stand up for justice, to carry our neighbors, to think beyond ourselves while learning to love ourselves. In addition to this, God's will is not an opportunity to push toxic ideologies. <laughs> a toxic trait that is often expressed in the Christian world is loving others at the expense of yourself. God isn't asking us to love others more than yourself. He's asking us to love your neighbor as yourself. If you, if you love people more than yourself, it is a toxic cycle of mental destruction and emotional trauma. 
But if you love yourself more than other people, you become narcissistic and excessively self-absorbed. And without a doubt, Christians can be prideful. I remember being eight or nine when I told my parents that I wanted to go on a mission trip. I used to beg them to go. I used to watch Maranatha on TV and other Adventist shows, watching them have so much fun helping others who ultimately needed to be helped. As I got older, I started thinking a lot about my passion for serving people. Was I really serving people for the benefit of them or myself? Every time I become a service to someone, it makes me feel good inside. I feel happy to have the ability to have resources and give them out to others that need it, and it makes me feel fulfilled. Do I really want to help others for the sole purpose of helping them, or do I want to feel, fulfill my desire for satisfaction? I still wrestle with this today. Sometimes we as Christians can be really full of ourselves when we feel called to talk about Jesus. Sometimes we have this Christian pride that makes us feel better than someone else due to the sole fact that we might have a close relationship with God compared to another person. When it comes to serving others, I have to watch my pride and fully understand that I am doing this for the benefit of someone else, not just to satisfy myself. In addition, we shouldn't guilt people into Jesus. We also shouldn't make other Christians fear talking about Jesus. Our mission can lead us into perpetual guilt because we want people to meet Jesus so badly that we can go to the extreme. Our mission should not lead people into shame, but to freedom. I've seen many examples of pushing spiritual guilt on online platforms, saying things along the lines of, if you don't like this video, then you don't like Jesus, or stitch this if you love Jesus. <laughs> I've fallen victim to this myself, feeling horrible if I skip or I don't participate. But I don't think that is God's will. God's will doesn't put you in a trap and box you in because you are loved for who you are. Your voice and your interpretation of the Bible are all valid and should be worth hearing. When Pastor Ben originally asked me to preach last year, I actually said no because I was scared of preaching the wrong thing. I was ultimately scared of talking about Jesus in the front of a congregation because I had the fear of upsetting somebody else in the audience. There were some individuals in my life who had implemented the idea that what I would say would be seen as wrong. But we all have our own interpretations and ideas about the Bible simply because we are all diverse and abundant in variance. This sole fact alone should be the reason why we should be able to hear each other's voices instead of silencing others who might have different thoughts. We should be able to converse together, agree to disagree, and grow through strugglesome and raw conversations. Mm. And we're still on this pushing toxic ideologies, something that we have to clear out and be understanding amongst each other is that your role in somebody's life, your role in society does not determine God's will. Just because you are a father or a mother does not mean you know God's will automatically. Just because you're a pastor does not mean I know God's will. And it's, it's important that we know that God's will isn't just for us. It's important that we know that God's will isn't just for our immediate we, the people that we're most comfortable with. And we have to name this because throughout time, We've seen Christian collectives do a lot of harmful things in the name of God. You know, first century Roman historian Tacitus shared this about the Romans around the time John wrote Revelation. And he writes, the Romans are deadly pillagers of the world. They have exhausted their land with indiscriminate plunder, and now they ransack the sea. They're the only people on earth whose covetousness, both riches and poverty, are equally tempting. To robbery, butchery, and rape, they give the lying name of government, and they create desolation and call it peace. And what's troubling, and what troubles me today is that when we look at the recent history around us, we can substitute the word Romans with Christians. We have done too much damage under the definition of God's will. We have, we have created too much pain and defined it as God's will. And the reality is some of us think that these things are justified, but God is not a God of harm. There have been times where I found myself angry about something, and as an excuse, I tell myself, it's not for me, but it's for God. And I need to fight for God. I need to defend God. But God does not ask us to fight for God. God needs us to love like God. There have been too many wars per perpetuated by Christians and not enough love from Christians. There's been a lot of rule keeping from Christians, but not enough love from Christians. In modern day, it might be hard to think about the bloody past of Christianity, but the abuse given by Christians doesn't necessarily have to be physical. It is more common for emotional abuse to be given off by Christians nowadays than it is for physical violence to occur. Another thing that God's will isn't, God's will is not an excuse to do nothing. 
The definition of a bystander is a person who is present at an event or an incident but does not take part. Another definition of a bystander is a person who is standing near and watching something that is happening but is not involved. And somehow, this definition has creeped into Christianity. It has creeped into the mindset of being a follower of Jesus. There's too much suffering around us to be bystanders. We see it on the news, and we feel useless about things that happen miles away or overseas, but if we want to start looking at things happening that are close to home, we just need to look around us. We just need to look in our direct community, in our schools, where we go to work, on our way to get groceries, there is suffering. And God's will is not for us to ignore suffering. And if we have nothing material to give, we can start by just learning to come close to people who are in pain, people who are suffering. And I want Lost Hair University Church to be a place where we can at least begin coming close to the people that we see around us in this room. God is a God of choice. God values autonomy. Because we know God is powerful, that doesn't mean that we should stay stagnant. Yes, there are life events that are out of our control, but things like tests in school are something that are up to our ability. For example, if I had a test in school and I chose not to study for that test, I go in and I take it and I fail it, I cannot go and say it was God's will for me to fail because God doesn't want us to fail. God gives us the choice in certain aspects of our life to excel in. His will is for us not to fail. We have to ask ourselves, what are the things that we can control? And lastly, God's will is not a reason to downplay people's pain. We are not meant to look at pain and tell ourselves that it is God's will. If somebody's struggling around you, practice being present instead of trying to define what's going on with them. I have said things like, maybe it's for the best. Maybe it's God's will, or uh, maybe it's God's plan, instead of asking how I can be helpful. And by pushing this agenda, it creates a lack of empathy for a pain that is so real to someone else. I've watered down their circumstance because I believe their pain was God's will. God's will on earth has sadly been packaged into something that can be harmful or something that can be negligent or destructive to our community and our relationships. But God's will is something much more. God's will is something that is not just easiest for me alone. God's will is something that benefits the collective and the collective beyond what is comfy for me. God's will for humanity in every context is love. And we know this from some of the things that Jesus even says. Jesus says, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Jesus says, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus says, love, love, love and love. And by doing this, God's will is done on earth. And in these verses, the root word that is used is agapao, right? Which means preferring to live through Christ, embracing God's will, mean, actively doing what the Lord prefers. Doing what the Lord prefers and embracing God's will is not about keeping rules. It's about loving one another. God doesn't say, Jesus doesn't say, you are mine because you come early to Sabbath school. Jesus doesn't say, you are my disciples because you love eating dinner roasts and stripples, right? Jesus doesn't say that you are my disciples because you like to dress up well on Saturday morning. Jesus says you are my disciples because you love one another. This is affirmed by the writer of 1 John who writes, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. All we need to do is love and the rest is up to us. But loving one another and being ourselves, by loving one another and being ourselves throughout that, we experience God's will today and tomorrow. Pastor Icky showed us last week that we experience the kingdom of God when God's preferred way is actualized. And today we are here to say that we experience the will of God when we live out those preferred ways by loving more. It's simple, but it's not easy. And it's not easy because we have to learn to push through a bunch of things. We have to learn to push through our comfort. Many times I see this overarching idea that being loving to certain people is bad. Sitting with a lonely kid at lunch that is socially shunned makes you socially shunned too. As a high school student, it might be hard for us kids to sacrifice our social status to be kind. I see this a lot in my generation and I ask this question, 
Why can't I just be a nice person? What is so wrong about being nice? And why is being kind being interpreted as something else? In this world, I think that we need to push through our comfort. We, not, we might not be able to change an entire present culture, but at least make sure that the kid on the outskirts of a circle is cared for. Mm. We have to learn to push through a culture where people do acts of kindness to get views or likes, making everyone skeptical of receiving love. In fact, it's unnatural to, for us to see a standard of love. How do I know this? Because if somebody came up to you today and was like, let me do the nicest thing for you, instantly guards would come up. We'd be wondering, what are they about? Is this a trap? Are they gonna make me owe them? What are they, what's really going on in their mind? We live in a society where people have to record themselves doing acts of kindness to either spread awareness or to make a spectacle of themselves. So we're all hesitant. And this makes us scared of showing love because we do not want to be received in a strange way. But loving one another is always worth it, no matter what the response is. We have to learn to push through our desire to compare our situation to someone else. Something that is difficult about being kind to one another and being loving to one another is that we also deserve to be loved and receive kindness. When I see somebody in the need of help, it's hard because I sometimes start thinking like, Who's been kind to me? We become hesitant to become a catalyst to love someone else because maybe we haven't been receiving that love as well. We find ourselves saying things like, I need help with things in my life, who's helping me? And the problem with that is that we create a cycle of selfishness instead of a mindset of selflessness. If we all decided to take care of one another, no matter how big our burdens were or are, maybe we'd all be okay. Maybe we'd be all doing all right. Even though we're all struggling, we're all helping one another. And that's what community is. That's what God's will looks like. The kingdom of God is when we see people around us as God sees them. And we bring the kingdom of God into reality when we begin to live out God's will, which is to love one another. God's will is for all of us. It surrounds all of us. There are so many choices we have to navigate in our lives. What school we go to, the people we invest in and commit to, our style of clothes, all of that is up to us. We can invite God's will to be a part of those choices by seeking how we can be loving in all areas of our lives. May we go forward living out God's will because we are loving those who are hard to love. Because we love in places that might make us uncomfortable to do so. May last year University Church be a place where the kingdom of God is created because God's will is being done here because we love each other. Amen.